welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. All right, Zoe. Have you watched Bridgerton yet? I have not. (laughs) Not even one episode. I am... Okay, so... Sorry, listeners. I'm really bad at TV. Like, I'm I'm really bad at TV. I'm bad at watching, like, shows. I never finish series because I get, like, upset. And I also, like, I just have, like, a hard time focusing on it. And the TV that I do watch is bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, like, there's also – I'm one of those people that, like, I, when I have a f- – I just have a feeling something's maybe not going to live up to my expectations. It's not going to fulfill everything that I'm hoping for. I have a hard time even starting it. But that being said, we are going to be watching it this week. (laughs) And that's okay, Zoe, because I loved it. You asked our followers on Instagram if they'd be binging it or they'd be savoring it or somewhere in between. And I watched the entire thing on Friday, the day it premiered. I had a friend come over and it was getting late and she's like, I think I need to go home. And I was like, but there's literally like two episodes left. (laughs) You can't go home for two episodes. (laughs) And so she stayed. We watched the entire thing and I have a lot of thoughts and feelings, but knowing you haven't watched it, Mm -hmm. I'm keeping most of them to myself. Well, thank you. You said most. What can you share with us here? I can share things that are non-spoilers. So Simone, who plays Kate, is the most gorgeous creature on the face of the planet. Um, I can say that from the posters even, like, yes. <laughs> like, her poise and her strength and just the way she comes across on the screen – Oh my God, she's so beautiful and so gorgeous, which is highlighted by the by the magnificence of their costumes, uh. which I was reading on like blog things and like the Sharma women, they really bring in their Indian heritage and even their costumes, like even though they're like very Regency designed, like Kate's are all in these beautiful jewel tones, you know, Ugh. and like the embroidery and just the little emphasis on like what they wear is very inspired by Indian culture. So like they're still bringing that to the screen. They're not just conforming to that Regency norm. And they're just gorgeous and beautiful, and I love it. I candy. And the last thing I will share is I really enjoyed the cinematographer's choice on how to portray that, like, sexual tension between Kate and mm. Anthony. Like, they really did a good job of it because it's like, you know, in the book, they have these like searing moments of just pure tension. And it's like, <laughs> how is that going to come across on the screen? And I thought they did a really good job of it. And I really liked those moments. I have other things to say, but I'm going to keep it to myself at this current moment in time. And we can talk about it later. I will say, though, I almost want to do a rewatch of the whole thing already which I never rewatch anything (laughs) unless it's been like years and years away. But I want to rewatch it because now that I've kind of like absorbed it and I can just, I kind of want to rewatch it for what it is instead of what my expectations were. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because, you know, as I kind of alluded to, I had a feeling that there was no way that it could live up to my hopes and dreams and expectations. Mm -hmm. So I feel like now I've kind of uh, maybe prepared myself mentally for that a little bit more. So it'll be really interesting to go into it with Mm -hmm. the first time with that mindset. And hopefully I better get, better get watching because there's, I just, I will not be able to binge it in one day. So I've got eight episodes to get through. So I need to get going. (laughs) Yes, you do. (laughs) One thing I also want to add is that We do want to hear from you, our listeners. We'd love to know your thoughts and feelings on Bridgerton Season 2 for when we do our discussion episode about it as well. So we've got a form where you can ask us questions that you'd like to know our opinions about, and you can add your opinions. And there's just a couple other like multiple choice uh, general group questions. It's really short, and you can answer as much or as little of it as you'd like. And the way to find that form is bit.ly slash mallet of death. 
All right, but we're going to pause from all this Bridgerton talk because we have a whole episode dedicated to it later on. Today, we are talking about a book that's not a Bridgerton book. No, and it's by another absolutely beloved author, Lisa Kleypas. Today, we are talking about Lady Sophia's Lover. Yes. So before we get into the book, I do have a history fact for us that I don't think we've done before. So fingers crossed. I wasn't sure. I don't think so either. I really don't think so. No. So today um, we're talking about the Bow Street Runners, which if you've read anything in Regency London, they kind of pop up all over the place. And this book Mm -hmm. really centers around the Bow Street Runners because our hero is a magistrate. Of He's the chief magistrate of the Bow Street Runners. So, Mm -hmm. the Bow Street Runners were the first professional police force organized in London by Henry Fielding in 1749. The group would end up successfully solving and preventing crimes until 1839, when the force was disbanded in favor of the Metropolitan Police, leaving behind a legacy for modern-day policing. Before the introduction of the Bow Street Runners, policing took the form of privately paid individuals used to maintain law and order without formal system connected to the state. This resulted in unofficial policemen who were known as thief takers, which comes up in our book, who would Mm -hmm. capture criminals for money and negotiate deals in order to return stolen goods whilst claiming rewards. Hmm. Henry Fielding, along with his half-brother, John, who was also magistrate, founded the Bow Street Runners, which was a paid police force with the intention of preventing and fighting crime. Henry was known for his motto of quick notice and sudden pursuit. The constables were formally trained, paid, and full-time serving officers, which was very different from the informal private system that had been going on. Instead, the men were paid using a government grant and therefore creating a closer link to a state-run law enforcement system that we know today. They were also to receive rewards when they caught their suspects, much like the thief takers, only with more formality and control in place. This idea proved to be effective, and by 1800, there was said to be around 68 Bow Street runners fighting crime in London. Now, so this was essentially the first professional police force in London and the Bow Street runners differed from their thief taking predecessors because they were not only formally attached to the Bow Street magistrate's office, but they were also paid by central government. Much of the work being conducted from Henry Fielding's own office in court at number four Bow Street, hence the name, the Bow Street runners, which Mm -hmm. we talk about number four in the book. Mm. The constables would arrest offenders on the authority of the magistrates and would travel across the country in pursuit of the criminals. Henry Fielding dedicated himself to making the streets of London safe again. He went about setting up a journal called the Covet Garden Journal, containing information about criminals and their activity, much like an 18th century version of Crime Watch. It served to make people aware, allowing them to assist in solving a crime and operating almost as a neighborhood watch, helping to reduce the likelihood of crime being committed. And they do talk about the daily journal in Mm -hmm. the book as well. It's like one of the first things, it's like one of the daily tasks that Sophia needs to take on. Sadly, nevertheless, the Bow Street Runners were eventually replaced in 1829 with the formation of the Metropolitan Police, and they would eventually disband entirely in 1839 after decades of pioneering police work tackling criminal activity on the streets of London. We definitely have not covered this before. And when I was reading this book, I thought the same thing. We should do the Bow Street Runners as a history fact. And this is the first time I'm reading this or hearing this. And it is so fascinating, especially like after reading this book, because I even wonder if our hero, Sir Ross Cannon, is supposed to be Henry Fielding. Like if he was in I think like a later counterpart, because the idea is like he took the Bow Street in hand and made it into that huge operation right. it was. You're right. Also, it's like it's it's the 1800s. Yeah. <laughs> so, so so he's definitely, um, yeah, he's definitely a, a, a not predecessor, a successor. Yeah. <laughs> of of Henry Fielding, and uh, but he's got a lot of the same characteristics. Very exciting. I think there's a lot of inspiration from from him oh, here. Absolutely. And I think what's really interesting with this history fact and why I wanted to do it was because reading this book, there seemed to be a lot of history in it, 
And I mm-hmm. felt like I was getting all these facts about Bow Street that I didn't have before. And so actually yeah. researching Bow Street, it's like, oh, that is exactly what she did. Like she took the history of Bow Street and created a story around it. And so I got all this information from historic-uk.com, and we will link to that in our show notes so you can read even more because I did not put everything in. I kind of condensed it down. And we also have tropes to talk about today. Yes. So kind of our main tropes are, you know, revenge, revenge lover is kind of (laughs) where it sets out to be. And then we also have brother and lover are enemies. Dun, dun, dun. Which is kind of like the second <laughs> half of the book. <laughs> yes. Uh, spoilers. <laughs> and our main characters today are Sir Ross Cannon and Lady Sophia Sidney. Yes. So shall we get into our synopsis? We shall. Lady Sophia Sidney has not had the life that was destined for her. Orphan when she was young, this daughter of a Viscount has been a servant for most of her adult life. She was recently sent away from her position with a cousin due to having an affair with a man who spoke of marriage, but actually already had a wife. Although disgraced, it has spurred Sophia to finally act on a plot of revenge. She plans to ruin the man who sent her younger brother to his death, the Chief Magistrate of Bow Street, Sir Ross Cannon. Sir Ross is known as the Monk of Bow Street. After his wife died in childbirth, Ross threw himself into his work and has turned the Bow Street runners into a professional service all of London depends on. Sophia comes to Sir Ross as an applicant for a position as secretary. She plans to use the position to gather evidence against him and his runners while also finding a way to seduce him and break his heart. After getting the position as secretary, Sophia begins to get to know Sir Ross. They instantly have an attraction to one another, and even though she should not, Sophia begins to care for Ross. For Ross's part, he has not desired a woman this much since he lost his wife. While he normally has no problem burying his desires deep down, with Sophia they tend to rise to the surface, and he is unable to stop himself from acting on it and kissing her. Shortly thereafter, Ross is shot while pursuing a criminal, and Sophia is there to assist in his recovery. This is a turning point in the relationship. On his first day of recovery, Ross and Sophia have an encounter that is rudely interrupted by a servant coming to relay some information from Bow Street to Ross. For Sophia, after working with Ross for over a month, she realizes that she has feelings for Ross that are not conducive towards revenge. Things culminate at a house party thrown by Ross's mother at their country estate. Sophia was brought on to help manage the event as housekeeper, and while there, Ross and Sophia finally lose the battle of sexual tension and make love. Ross then proceeds to ask Sophia to marry him. Sophia is at a loss. How can Ross want to marry her, especially after she confesses to wanting to seek revenge on him for the death of her younger brother? Ross understands her hesitancy, but also wants to prove his feelings are genuine and will not change even after discovering he may have had a hand in her brother's death. During their research, they find that Sophia's knowledge of the crimes of her brother are not correct. Ross actually did him a service of sending him to a prison hulk instead of to the gallows, which was the fate of the rest of the people who were arrested with her brothers. However, this is not the point of Happily Ever After. Sophia keeps one more secret from Ross, for it turns out that she discovers her brother is actually alive. He assumed the identity of another inmate upon their death and was reborn as Nick Gentry, who currently is the reigning king of the underworld and also a renowned thief taker, basically a bounty hunter. And of course, he and Ross are bitter enemies, and Ross's final goal for his career is to bring Nick Gentry to justice. Keeping this information from Ross, Sophia still agrees to marry him. She loves him, and the idea of being away from him for any reason is devastating. They get married, and things are great until Nick Gentry is caught and taken to Newgate. It does not look good for him, and Sophia finally unveils the truth of her connection to Nick to Ross. Ross is extremely unhappy to hear that his wife is keeping secrets from him, but he is still a very good man and comes up with a plan to help Nick. 
He offers Nick a chance to turn his skills towards good. In exchange for holding back evidence, Ross offers Nick a position at Bow Street as a runner. Turn his skill towards legal good instead of working outside the law. Nick sees this as unfortunate, but his only way out of redemption and takes it. Our story ends with an epilogue where Sophia and Ross have a beautiful baby girl, and they can start their life together filled with love and companionship. Well, that was a very concise synopsis and kind of perfect because now there is so much I want to discuss. So shall we first adjourn to the parlor? We shall. So today we're going to be short and sweet here in the parlor and just remind you that if you'd like to find us on social media, you can find us on Instagram at T as in Tom, N as in Nancy Strumpets, Twitter at T as in Tom, N as in Nancy Strumpets, Facebook slash T and Strumpets, and YouTube by searching our name. And if you're listening to us on YouTube, or even if you haven't, we are so close to reaching our goal of a thousand subscribers. So please do us a favor and hit that subscribe button so that way we we can unlock some future great things for us. <laughs> uh, and this is a great way to show your support of the show. So please help us reach that goal. And there's a handy link to subscribe to our YouTube channel in the show notes. Also, if you'd like to subscribe to something else, you can subscribe to our email notifications via our website. If you subscribe, you'll be the first to know what we're reading each month. Plus, you'll get all sorts of extras, including exclusive content from each of the authors who join us on the podcast. Our website is romancepod.com, and there you can find episodes, more information about us, and other resources. So take a look. Finally, rate, review, and tell a friend. Reviews on Apple Podcasts, Facebook, or anywhere else you can review us really help other listeners find the podcast. And word of mouth is also one of the best ways that podcasts get found. So if you like what you're hearing, we'd love it if you could spread the word. All right. Now we get to talk about Lady Sophia's Lover. Yes. And first... I want to say that I think both of us thought we had read this book before. However, I don't think either of us has had read this book before. Had not. (laughs) Absolutely not. And what a treat. What a treat to like have this this little, in my opinion, gem uh, of a read to enjoy for the first time. Yes. You know, and it was something when you suggested it and it was funny because we were trying to think of a book to read and Mm -hmm. we were kind of were like, okay, we want to do Lisa Kleypas. Let's look through it. Let's see if we can find one that, you know, isn't a Ravenel's or a Wallflower's. Let's see if we can find another one. And you mentioned Lady Sophia's Lover, which was funny because I was like, oh, what's this Bow Street series? Do I know this Uh Bow Street series? And Lady Sophia's Lover happened to be the second book in the series. Yeah, we we chose not to read the first book because I think it had an amnesia plot. And I I just really ha- – I hate those. I mean, just to be honest, like I I really hate amnesia plots. So we just didn't want to dive into one that I wasn't excited about because we – Life's too short. Not what we were looking for yeah. at, this, at this episode. <laughs> we don't want to read a book that is always already prejudiced against before she even I opens know. it. It, you know, sometimes we do. So, you know, if there's other reasons, but, you know, we I just, we were looking for something joyful and I think we found it. I think we did too. I did really enjoy this. I will say reading this book, I was very interested in Nick's story, which was the next book. And I'm almost done with that book now. <laughs> it's funny because as soon as I heard his name on the page, I was like, wait a minute. I know this man. (laughs) And it's like, I, and then I was like, I think I knew immediately he was her brother. Mm -hmm. I was like, he is not who he says he is because I am sure I've read his book somehow. Like I've read his book. I've read his name. Like I remember him, Mm -hmm. but I didn't, I definitely hadn't read Lady Sophia's Lover before. Yes. So it was really good. I did enjoy as far as plots are concerned, like, I, I do like a revenge plot. I like an enemies, you know. I like where there's kind of, like, a mutual thing they can fight towards or at least 
if they're keeping secrets from one another, it's, you know, for a purpose and not, I just don't know how to express myself. Yeah. And so I really did enjoy that. I liked the twist of the brother still being alive, which, Mm -hmm. I mean, we've read a lot of these. I was like, I feel like the brother's still alive. (laughs) And then especially like, you know, the first hints are like, Sophia starts receiving these like gifts that are like very personal you know, yeah. and like come from her past. And she's like, this is weird. And I'm like, her brother's alive. <laughs> He's not yet dead for sure. <laughs> but but when it is revealed how he lived, it was like, oh, well, that's actually very believable. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. in, in a fictional setting, it was like, this is actually a very believable way of someone surviving this almost inescapable situation. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. So I, you have a note here too that you, you, under general thoughts that you said was not as full as a flow as her later novels. And I actually completely agree. Yeah. Like they're just Re- like, there seemed to be kind of like, you know, the, the plot line was good. Like the plot line was like thought out. Like I liked the characters. I liked the plot mm-hmm. line. All of that was good. But I feel like the transitions from one scene to another, mm-hmm. it, it sometimes felt really abrupt. Like it was sometimes like, paragraph to paragraph you were taken somewhere else and there wasn't like a natural break or like a natural conclusion it was kind of like it just felt very abrupt to me and I was like oh that's you can see the essence of where she's going Mm -hmm. in this I believe this is an earlier novel of hers you know and so like she's got like all the good bones but like when I read a Ravenel's or the wallflowers, you know, I'm swept through the entire thing. Like, I don't think anything's abrupt. Like, the flow of it is just all the way through versus this one. You kind of get into the flow and then it was like, oh, change. I agree it in a similar fashion. I don't know if I necessarily noticed it like that, but there was definitely just like some times where she would kind of just like sum something up in a couple of sentences that were just very like descriptive, like this is how they felt, you know, or like this happened and then this happened and then this happened rather than kind of showing it through experiences of the characters, Mm -hmm. which I think is what the, you know, writers with a little bit more maturity and experience and what's the other word I'm looking for? Um, confidence do. Um, I, I think experience is really the the big thing. And so it, d- it didn't quite have the same flow, but as her later novels, just like you were saying, but it had all of the essence. Like it's still, like I still loved reading this book and just didn't want to set it down. Like there was something there, you know, there's just something about some writers that really like resonate with you as a reader. And Lisa Kleypas is one of them, even in kind of her slightly less, I would say, polished forms. Mm -hmm. But like, it's at the same time, I think I liked this book more than Chasing Cassandra. Yeah. I was wondering if you were going to say that because like Chasing Cassandra felt, I thought the flow in that one was better, but I just felt it was, it was very quick versus Mm -hmm. this one. The flow for me wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But, like, I could still get wrapped in the story a little bit. There was a little bit more nuance to it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you and I generally hate it when there are secrets. But the great thing, the kind of redeeming thing I would say about this book is, number one, all of the secrets were revealed when they needed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like – and when they were revealed, they had honest and open conversations about it that were very mature. Like when when Ross finds out about Sophia's brother, he like, like the words that he says to her, I can't remember exactly, are but there's something to do with like, you should have told me this before. I am mad that you didn't tell me this before, but you know, now we can deal with it. Yeah. And I also know why you didn't tell me this before. Like, I can understand why you didn't tell me this before. Like, I'm upset that you felt the need to withhold this from me, but I understand why you did. Yeah. And even though, but I'm also mad about it. Yeah. But I'm allowed to be mad about it, (laughs) but I understand. And I was just like, and that was, I will say this too. It's like all the secrets were revealed in good time. And when it, was time to reveal them. There was no hesitancy in revealing them. You know, like it, it wasn't half truths. No, or it was like here's the it. whole thing. Yeah, I, definitely the plot was long. Um, you left a lot out, which is good. It's fun to read because I remember getting halfway through the book and being like, 
they're married. We still have half of a book. Like, where's going to be the, 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 you know, the problem, right? Yeah. And you, you know, it's going to have something to do with her brother, mm-hmm. but um, <laughs> you're just like, uh oh, there's a lot, lot still to come. So, um, but I really uh, generally, enjoyed the read. And like I said, didn't want to put it down. I I agree. I was the same way. Like I started it really late at night. So then I fell asleep. But then I like for I woke up, made myself a cup of tea and like just sat down and finished the book. Like I didn't even bother trying to not finish the book. I was like, nope, I'm just going to sit down and read this. So yeah, this definitely got me out of a slump because I tried two other books before it and both of them were like barely three star reads for me. Like I was Mm -hmm. kind of not that into either of them, but this one just swept me away and let me really have some escapism. But that's what we love from Elisa Kleypas. It is what we love. So let's talk a little bit more about our hero and heroine. Can we talk first about Sophia? Yes, we can. Now I wrote it in my general thoughts, but it's really like much more a hero, heroine opinion. Now, The beginning of it, Sophia's like, I'm here to seek revenge. It happens Mm -hmm. on like the first page she tells you this. Well, but it's so great. The very beginning, you don't like the very first scene with the two of them is so great. And you don't get that. Mm -hmm. And then the next like scene is her being like, I have weaseled my way in. I am here for revenge. Yes. And you're like, oh, you're like, revenge. (laughs) But I will say this is like, she tells you this. And then all her actions, and maybe it's just not described in the book, but like even when she is trying to be like sneaky, I'm like, you just aren't like you're telling me you're here for revenge for this reason, reason, but I really don't feel enough righteous indignation from you. Like, I never really believed she was going to carry out the plot of revenge because she just seemed to lack that like absolute fire. It was more like, I don't know what to do with my life. I guess I'll go seek revenge. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it. she didn't seem particularly, like, built for revenge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but at the same time, like, in – in, I think she was thrown off by meeting Sir Ross and yeah. him being so not what she expected. She expected a stuffy old um, kind of – Man that's really, like, mean and harsh and instead he's, like, a younger – well, not younger. He's, like, a 40-year-old guy who's just doing his job. Yeah. I suppose we could also call this an age gap romance because they're technically 12 years apart. I feel like that constitutes as an age gap, even though she's 28 and he's 40. But anyhow, so let's talk about (laughs) Sophia. I loved her. First of all, she was funny. She had this wit and this humor, this like dry humor that kind of flew off the page. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was – her flirting was just like so cute and funny like it was always like funny flirting that would catch him off guard right yeah. like in moments that were like serious she'd kind of like bring something in and it wouldn't be completely like overt but it could be and she just I really enjoyed her as a character I did too I think one of the things that really stood out to me was like I'm here for a plot of revenge but I really need to get this household in order because like we really need to be doing a better job here and I was like yes girl yes you fix those household problems yeah um she definitely you know steps in and just gets stuff done but she also gets herself a job at a place where a woman shouldn't get a shouldn't be hired Mm -hmm. and you know it's not just because of the attraction like in the beginning sir ross you like he recognizes that she's an attractive young lady Mm -hmm. um, and and is kind of like is she is she is she flirting with me or is she trying to get a job, you know? Yeah, I can't tell. But he he's not completely like, you know, he's not completely attracted to her. What I think makes him hire her is her circumstances and him being an actual like good human being and being like, I need to give this woman a place to be safe. Like mm-hmm. that's what I think makes him hire her, not like – I want to go be in bed with this woman. No, I don't think so, too. I think it definitely came from a place of, one, I think he appreciated her honesty because she's like, yeah, I can't get hired anywhere else. But, And he really did, does feel for her. And he's like, well, she seems capable enough. Like, I don't know if this is the job for her, but, you know, we'll give it a go, you know? Yeah. And in fact, he does. He puts her on, what, a trial period? (laughs) 
Yeah. 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 He does. So uh, yeah. And, and in general though, with Sophia, I just like, I just found her delightful. I don't know about you. I did like her. I like, I liked both of them, to be perfectly honest. Like, I just, I thought they were a good match for each other. And I liked, I thought they were very comfortable in their own skin, if that makes sense. Yes. And they were, their chemistry together was awesome. Like, the scenes between them Mm -hmm. were what made this book. I think all of their dialogue and banter, yeah, all the dialogue and banter was like, that's what makes the book. And mm-hmm. you just you just want them so badly to be together. Um, so I'm ready to rate Sophia. What would what would you rate her? I'm going to give her a seven. Fair. Mm-hmm. She, uh, she was good, but I think she was also great. So I'm gonna give her an eight. Super. I really enjoyed her. I thought she was funny, and funny always gets me. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. No, I really did enjoy her. I think yeah, I'm gonna stick with seven. Like solid, fair enough, very solid. But- so then there's Sir Ross, and we haven't talked about him yet. And I definitely want to discuss about him because he's like, he's kind of hot. He is kind of <laughs> hot, and like a very like capable. I'm like, you're a professional, sir. You know what I think? You know, we're all in our time in our life where we don't really need a rake. What we need is we need a man who can get things done. And he respects Sophia, like he from the respects beginning. Everyone, he's like genuinely a good human, and he like you know he looks after his people. He wants to make sure they're safe. Like he wants mm-hmm. Sophia to be safe. Like he really takes care of all people around him. But it's not like that toxic masculinity of like defending the woman. Like he works together with her Mm -hmm. in everything. Like even when she doesn't want to come to the prison, like she, he doesn't want her to come to the prison to visit her brother. Like he, he allows her to come because he, you know, she says something like, you know, if, if the roles were reversed, like you would, you would want to come. And he, he understands that. Yeah. Um, So it's definitely like, he's just. He's mature and not toxic, but he's very masculine and Mm -hmm. very like, I don't know. He just knows what he wants and it's great. And it worked for me. (laughs) Yeah, no, it worked for me too. Like, and I love it too, in the sense of where his mother asked to bring Sophia to her to help replace her housekeeper who left unexpectedly before this house party for a week Mm -hmm. and asked Sophia to help run it. And Sophia's like, oh, I know what that'll take. That's going to take a lot. And mm-hmm. he's like, you can do it. I thought that part of the plot was so weird. I thought I was waiting for there to be the reveal of the mom, like the mom being like, I know my son wants to marry you. Oh, I know. And I thought so that was I'm totally going to happen, like, but she was put like in an actual housekeeper's quarters and not like in a guest room, guest room. So I was like, I'm confused. Yeah. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> it was a little weird because it, it definitely felt like the mom was like auditioning her as daughter-in-law, but more just like being like, I just want to get to know you and see what you're capable of. Mm-hmm. But we never actually got the that scene. So I wonder if it was, I don't know. It it doesn't really matter because fun things happened at the house party. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I'm just I'm ready to rate Ross. Great. And I'm gonna give Ross an eight. I am also going to give him an eight. They were both great. I loved them equally. Super. Now, do you have a favorite quote from the book? Oh, gosh. I have so many. Um, So I'll just choose like a little moment between the two of Mm -hmm. them where Sophia's being um, quick and clever. And I like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is fairly early in the book, but um, it's just some dialogue between the two of them. And it says, quote, It does not matter that she wouldn't have blamed me, he said gruffly. I know where the fault lies, directly with me, Ross says. Naturally, you would think so, came Sophia's wry response. You seem to believe that you are omnipotent and that everything good and bad should be attributed to you. How difficult it must be for you to accept that some things are simply beyond your influence. (laughs) That's great. I like it because he's always like taking the world on his shoulders and she just like, she's like, it's. The world is not on your shoulders. You're fine. (laughs) Well, and the next sentence is, her tender mockery was curiously comforting. And I think that's 
the thing between them because mm-hmm. she doesn't treat him like a, you know, a man who just needs like a simpering wallflower. She's like, get a grip on yourself. Yeah. You know, and um, they, they, they make each other better. Agreed. And I think that's why that chemistry worked so well. And so I have a quote. I was kind of looking for a quote that wasn't the dialogue because I really think like the dialogue is really the highlight of it. And there's there is a lot of good dialogue. I was like looking mm-hmm. through for a quote and it was really funny because every time I stopped on a page, I was literally like in a sexy encounter moment. And I was like, OK, this is great. But this wasn't <laughs> what I was trying to show. Yeah. So this is she's keeping the secret from him, but mm. there still shows like that passion Mm -hmm. between them. So the quote is, the temptation to confide in Ross was overwhelming, and she bit her lip to contain the words that battled frantically inside her. Only the chilling fear of losing him kept her silent. Trembling from distress and frustration, she leaned harder against his supportive body. Mm. Yeah, they just had a lot of chemistry they did. like through everything mm-hmm. which is why we have seven encounters in this, this entire book this book kept going <laughs> and the thing is there was a lot of non-encounter moments that like that not that we a call an encounter but there was tons of these little moments and you know fade to black moments and Oh yeah. Other moments like they were hot and heavy. Also, well, they get married. They get married in the middle of the book. Yes. So like they they aren't just like finding broom closets, you know, even though they do. <laughs> but you know, like they they're married, so they can have sex more easily too, you know. Yes. I, I don't know. Although they find <laughs> my favorite encounter was only because I always find this so silly, but they're touring the house that they're going to rent in Mayfair, like the nice house, because they Mm -hmm. were living at the Bow Street quarters. And now that they're married, he's like, no, we're not going to live there. Like, we're going to rent this house. And they find an indoor riding horse, you know, for like practice. (laughs) And then they proceed to have sex on the horse. But it's not a real (laughs) horse, which is funny because they're like romance, like inconceivable sex on a horse. And I'm like, See, but this is sex in a horse that I can understand and get behind. I'm still not quite sure about the mechanics of it, but you know, it's a far more believable situation than trying to screw on an actual horse. <laughs> that is true. So we've already sort of mentioned it, but we've got our feminist recap now. Um, I think this book is very feminist. I think so I think- too. And I think the thing that sticks out to me as like the strongest kind of you know, the strongest, its strongest quality is the way, you know, Ross respects Sophia and, you know, knows that she can do the job of a secretary. It doesn't ever, isn't ever like too worried about her being capable. He's more worried about other people and their perception of her, which I understand it's Regency times, like that's not normal for a woman to be in that position and mm-hmm. around that many men. Um, but he also, like I said, like he he listens to her, he respects her, and he, you know, he wants a partner in life. And I and think that's, that's the <laughs> biggest thing that was found was that they were partners. And he even thinks about it later on because he reflects on his marriage with his first wife, who, you know, he loved in his own way, but he realizes they very much had like a typical society marriage of where they really were mm. separated, even though they had, you know, they liked they liked each other, maybe even loved each other, but it wasn't the partnership that someone like him needed versus Sophia. Like she sees him working long hours and it's not that she stops him, but she's like, okay, but if you're going to do this, you got to at least eat, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, you do have to come home eventually. Um, I'm going to stay with you in order to help you come home. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they were partners. And I guess we have some other kind of points that, you know, for discussion with feminism and, and thinking about these books. And so like, you know, what is this book setting out to do? I think this book is setting out to show us um, a healthy relationship Mm-hmm. Of two people who, you know, can support each other and be partners. And I think this book accomplishes what it's setting out to do. Would you agree? I would agree with that. I think that something that is a bit of the fallacy and something that even with my own journey in life is like, 
you know, I thought to be like a strong feminist woman, like I had to be more of my own person Mm -hmm. and like, oh, but my husband needed to be able to support me like doing my thing and being who I was, which is true. But at the same time too, I feel like it's much more what you're looking for in that sense of like what a marriage is and what the kind of relationships that you need to be a strong person with your own strong convictions is you need someone who's a partner with you, who supports you, who gives you the support, even if they don't necessarily know what you're doing, but they're like, I'm here for you. I support you. I'm going to give you those. I'm going to help you find those opportunities. I'm not going to let you not take those opportunities. Mm-hmm. And so I think, like you said, it's it's a healthy, strong partnership of a relationship. And again, even with things like secrets are kept, but then secrets are revealed. Okay, now we deal with them. Yeah, it's showing you how to deal with difficulties in a healthy, mature way. Um, And you don't always get that in fiction because that's not where the tension always lies, right? Like the tension sometimes lies in one person being immature Mm -hmm. and reacting poorly, you know, or one person being traumatized and reacting poorly and then learning from that. But in this book, I think we had two well-adjusted people who were really well matched and you know show us this like really kind of awesome partnership that you know I think is also another another relationship to strive for and want you know depending on who you are and and what you're looking for in life so absolutely I love them that's all (laughs) (laughs) so Zoe what would you give this book as a final rating you know I'm gonna give this book Oh, this is hard. I'm wavering. I'm going to give it an 8.5. Mm-hmm. I was close to giving it a 9, but I think that I think that the book um it just doesn't feel like it has the, you know, uh polish or maturity of of some of her later works. Mm-hmm. And I feel silly saying that because it, I don't love it any less. You know, Mm -hmm. I, but at the same time, I think it wasn't quite as, I think the relationship and the chemistry between the characters and the characterization and the character development is like off the charts, but the plot, um, is a little, um, hefty and, uh, meandering and just some of the writing just isn't quite as, as, as perfect as we expect from Miss Kleypas now. Um, (laughs) But I just, I loved this book. It's such a good book. And I would highly recommend this book to anybody who wants to smile at the end. I would agree. And I, for me, I'm rating it a little bit lower. I'm in a Mm 7.58. Mainly just, as you said, like, I like a lot of it. I like the characters. I, you know, the plot's good. I like where it ended up. I think it has so many good parts to it. Um, but there is kind of that missing that je ne sais quoi <laughs> yeah. that the other books have that I, you know, I love. And so it's just, it's missing just that little bit, but I don't think, like you said, I think it's still a really good book. And it's like I said, it's not like I was turned off from the characters. I'm thoroughly enjoying the next book. Yeah. And I love seeing like Ross and Sophia play a big part in that book as well. And I'm really enjoying seeing them further. So like, you know, 7.58, like kind of hovering in there. (laughs) So we're both saying this was a really good book. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, I'm so glad we chose it. And I'm so glad we got to talk about these characters and Lisa Kleypas. And it definitely makes me want to read Nick's book also. So maybe I will do just that. I think you'll enjoy it. So Kelsey, what are we doing next episode? Next episode, we will be talking about Bridgerton season two. We're going to be talking. Finally. Yeah, finally. (laughs) Thoughts and opinions. If you have thoughts and opinions that you would like us to share, or if you just want to share with us, Please let us know. You can submit those thoughts, opinions, and other things. Thoughts, opinions, <laughs> questions, life advice. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but you can submit that at bit.ly slash mallet of death. 
Yes. And so that is going to be open. So this episode is going out on... April 14th. So our episode for Bridgerton is going to be coming out on April 28th. So we're going to keep that link open for one more week. So until the 21st of April, that will be open for submissions. And we look forward to hearing what you thought about Bridgerton and what questions that you have for us that you'd like to hear us discuss on our show. So again, the link to that is bit.ly slash mallet of death. Yes. So, and of course, as always, please rate, review, and subscribe. Tell a friend. We're looking to do some exciting things this year. So yes. tell some more people, get some more people on the bandwagon. <laughs> We so appreciate all your support, and there is no support more than you listening to us all the way through to the end. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're still here with us, thank you so much for listening, and join us next time as we discuss Bridgerton Season 2. And may all your ever-afters end happily. Happily.